we've been uh, dealing with, and that we have been talking about power and the systems of this world, and, and where God wants the believers to be. Um, God wants us to move into the corridors of power. There will always be challenges to our faith. There will be temptations. There will be contentions. There will be frustrations because the systems of this world are not designed for the believer. The systems of this world are designed for the unbeliever. It is easier to make it as an unbeliever than to make it as a believer because the systems favor you to be unrighteous. If you decide to be right with God, your, your battle is stronger. And that is what Daniel had to deal with. He had to deal with the Babylonian system and had to not just survive, but thrive and succeed and rise to the top of his game. And today we're going to look at, uh, my subtitle will be Kingdoms, and the, in the Courses of Power, Kingdoms. And I'm going to focus mostly in Daniel chapter 2. I, I did most of chapter 1 last, yesterday, and uh, I'll do chapter 2. Uh, and in chapter 2, we were, we're going to see the first major task that Daniel had to deal with. He had been trained in chapter 1, carried into captivity, trained. Now he has to work. And we're going to look at the first assignment that he had to deal with. But before I get into that, I want to define what a kingdom is. What a kingdom is. A kingdom is first and foremost a realm where the king has sovereign power. A realm or a territory where a king or the king has sovereign power. The word sovereign means absolute power. Absolute power. In a democracy, sovereign power rests with the people. In a kingdom, sovereign power rests with one man. He holds all the power, the king. Of course, uh, as of this time in human history, we don't have real kingdoms. We have uh, constitutional monarchies and other forms of Republican uh, monarchies. Uh, the Queen of England doesn't have much power. Uh, Parliament has the power. Uh, I think I hear that uh, uh, Swaziland is the only place where we have something close to an absolute monarch. Even he has a parliament, but every year he chooses uh, whom to marry. <laughs> Just points his finger and you're gone. You know, so that's a lot of power. <laughs> And the people actually volunteer for that service. So I think he has about 17 or so and, and adds up every year. He's a young man. I thought he was an old man, but I, I saw his picture. He's a young man. I said, at this age, you have 17. We want to see what you would look like at 70. But uh, he has, he, even he doesn't have absolute power because he has a parliament and he cannot just legislate everything. But in the days of old, the king had absolute power and he determined who lived, who died, who had money, who didn't have money, uh, and so on and so forth. So a kingdom is a place where the king has absolute power. It's a very important uh, concept. Second, a kingdom it, uh, refers to all the people living under the rule of a king. All the people living under the rule of of a king. That's a kingdom. And thirdly, a kingdom is the space, the territory that the king rules over. So uh, when we talk about a kingdom, there has to be a king, there has to be a territory, and there has to be people. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to begin our first request in the Lord's Prayer is, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. God's desire is to establish his kingdom on earth. If, you, if I want to give you a simple way to understand 
the theme of the Bible. The Bible is a book of kingdoms. Is a book of kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Always in contention. Always in a struggle. God wants to establish his kingdom amongst men. Men want to establish their kingdom without God. So there is always a struggle of kingdoms on earth. We're going to look at the first human kingdom that was established. The first human kingdom. And it's in the book of Genesis chapter 10 verses 8 to 10. This is right after the flood. Genesis chapter 10 verse 8 to 10. It says, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be mighty, a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. But I want you to note uh, the first kingdom that he built. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. This is very significant to what Daniel is doing now. The beginning, the first human kingdom that was established was called Babel. Now, if you go to chapter 11 of uh, the book of Genesis from verse 1 to 9, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, they had asphalt for mortar, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord God came to see what the city and the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this that they begin to do, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there, confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, the, uh, from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad from all over the face of the earth. The first human kingdom is Babel. Babel is what developed later into Babylon. The first Babel kingdom was scattered by God, but there were people who would always revisit what Nimrod attempted to do. And over the, the space of human history, several kings would try to rebuild what Nimrod had failed to build. And the most successful of those people who could rebuild what was stopped uh, at the Tower of Babel was King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar rose up in the land of where we now call Iraq. And out of that place, rebuilt the old Babel. Now, if you look at the kingdom of Babel, there are a few things that you would notice are clear in the kingdom of Babel. Is that there is a lot of imagination in the kingdom of Babel. The God himself says what they imagine to do. Now, you have to understand that they are living in a world at a level of civilization where there were no cranes. There were no tall buildings. The only tall things were mountains. And if you would notice, most of the religions of the world uh, have uh, worshipped on mountains because it was thought that if you were high on the mountain, you were getting closer to God. But the people of Babel decided, we're not going to worship on a mountain, we'll create our own height. So they had imagination that they could do it. That takes a lot of creativity or a lot of thinking in your mind. A people of great imagination. The second thing you would notice is creativity. They manufactured building materials. We are not told whether this was the first time uh, it had been manufactured or it had been manufactured earlier. But there is imagination 
and creativity. Third thing you would notice about the, the kingdom of Babel is rebellion. So they are imaginative, they are creative, and they are rebellious. They wanted to see God in his face. Build something that will bring them to God. They wanted to rival God. If God has made mountains, we are building towers. So whatever God has done, they had to find a creative way to parallel it. To be able to say, we also can create our own mountains. We don't need what God has created. Now, just to give you an idea, if you see a lot of the scientific development that is going on, it's the spirit of Babel at work. Much of it is Babel. People are not just doing it so human life will be convenient. They are doing it to say, if God did it in creation, we can also do it scientifically. It's the spirit of Babel. Nimrod was described as a hunter before the Lord. He seemed to be a man who started with God and later became very self-centered. The third, th fourth thing you would notice about Babel is confusion, that God confused them and scattered them. So this is the beginning of Babylon. Although the first project ended, now a new man has arisen, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's building Babel. It is in this massive renewal, renaissance of the Babylonian system that God plucked his people from Judah and threw them into Babel because God wanted to invade the Babylonian system. So Daniel now comes into Babylon. He comes in as a slave, but it is a reenactment of an old battle. There is going to be a battle of kingdoms. The kingdom of God now planted in the kingdom of Babylon. And one of those kingdoms must rule and the other must fall. Now, if you would look at it, you would think, well, Daniel's kingdom had been overtaken or overthrown or, or defeated because Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Judah, had conquered Israel, and, and carried them captive. So on the face, it looked as if the Babylonian system had succeeded. And God's kingdom has now been defeated. So, the question we, we are going to look at today in dealing with the corridors of power is whether the kingdom of God can survive in the Babylonian system or the people of God can survive in the Babylonian system. I don't know about you, but if you look around in the world and if you're honest with yourself, it would look as if the church of Jesus Christ has been defeated. Take any industry. All the pillars I talked about, you look at the family system, we've been run out of the family system. The family has been now redefined. Gender is being defined. I hear now there are about 13 possible genders. Crazy. But, you know, it looks as if the church has been run out. We've lost the battle. If you look at education, we've been run out of education. If you take a hundred professors in any university in this country, it will be rare to find a real genuine Christian amongst them that goes beyond 5% of that number. The whole college system, the whole intellectual system is lost. The church is lost in the universities. You come to the media, the church is lost. I said the first time, Christian television occupies in this country, just has, holds only 2% of the media market. All the TBN and Daystar and Word and all the noise they make is just 2%. Everybody's struggling for 2%. The world has taken over. Science, the world has taken over. Business, the world has taken over. Government, the world has taken over. The Babylonian system seems dominant and the church is defeated. Now, what we see now is what Daniel had to deal with. 
Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon has taken over the whole world. And Judah, the praise of God, has been defeated and taken into captivity. And little Daniel and his other colleagues, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, have to join him. The rest are just slaves, slaving away in the kingdom of Babylon. It is in this environment that this young man goes to confront the superpower of the world. And that is where we have to start thinking. Can we as believers of this time enter into the world system and reclaim it for Christ? Can we enter into the Babylonian system and let our presence be felt? So Daniel comes into the kingdom. He is a new graduate from the University of Nebuchadnezzar. He's just been graduated. When you graduated from the university, you either uh, graduate as an astrologer, as, a, as an interpreter of dreams, as a wise man, you know, whatever they, that meant. And Daniel graduated as a wise man, so probably he had a degree in philosophy. And, and he's supposed to be wise. So, just after graduation, there was a national crisis. The king goes to sleep, and he has the most horrible dream of his life. <clears throat> the dream just shakes him to his core, because the dream seemed to challenge his kingdom. And he's perplexed. He wakes up in the morning, totally perplexed. He calls the assemblage of all his professional advisors. And he tells them, guys, I had a horrible dream last night, and I need to understand what it means. I need interpretation. They said, fair enough. Tell us a dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. He says, no, the stakes are too high this time. And I really need to know whether the advice you're giving me is convenient or real. Whether you just make up, you know, policies to put on my table and tell me this is the best policy. So I'm not going to tell you the dream. You have to tell me first what I dreamt. And then you tell me what it means. They said, sir, it has never happened this way. You tell us a dream and we interpret. He says, the stakes are too high. I need to be very sure you're giving me the sound advice. And he says, if you don't, your head goes. I like absolute monarchs. <laughs> your head is gone. They just pop off your head. So, he gives them time, they go, and they don't have any answer. He says, let the killing begin. So they start cutting off all these wise men. They're cutting off the astrologers and killing all these, all these specially trained uh, faculty members in the universities who can solve the problem, and project leaders, and project managers, and, and scientists, and all kinds of, all these experts, IT professionals who can solve the problem. He's just knocking them off one by one, one by one. So they've, they've dealt with a higher hierarchy. The top advisors are now killed. Second level management is now killed. Now he's now go, getting devil lower and lower to supervisor level. I mean, the killing is getting close. So the executioner now, he's now gotten close to the new recruits, the new graduates. So he goes to the graduate quarters, knocks on the door and says, well, I've come here to just cut off your heads. They say, what's going on? They say, well, the king, has, the king had a dream and, and uh, couldn't interpret it. And the, the dream is scaring him. And, and he said uh, the wise men should interpret it. Wise men can't interpret it. And he says we should just clear off the wise men because they are not really genuine professionals. I think one of these days we should tell some of these professors some of these things. So uh, Daniel says, well, 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 well. I, I think this is the first time you're giving us this option. So... 
we think we can solve this because we have another source of information that we didn't get from this university. We, we brought that source of information from Judah with us. And through that system and the Judah technology, we can access information that is superior to the Babylonian system. So go tell the king that there are some four guys here who have a new technology to show him tomorrow morning. And we will come to the palace and tell him what he dreamt and what it means. I'm trying to bring it into modern language. So go tell the king, we will come and answer him. Now it takes a lot of courage for a defeated people who have seen superior minds defeated to think that they, former slaves, can answer the king. The believer has to understand what we do in our prayer meetings, speaking in tongues and talking in the spirit is not just a joke. It's not just a spiritual part time or pastime. We are actually engaging the mind of the creator of the universe. And he can breathe into us ideas that are superior to the people out there. If we are not afraid of their knowledge, God will use us like Daniels in our time. So now, Daniel comes in the next day, and I want us to read his response to the king in Daniel chapter 2, from verse 31 to verse number 44. And this is what Daniel says. You, O king, he's now interpreting the, the, the dream. He tells the king the dream. I don't want to read too much scripture, but he tells them, him, listen, king, you had a dream and you saw a big image. Now, you can't make up such dreams. You can't make it up. I mean, you, you could just say, you know, you had a dream and there was a big horse. But, and then there was something that looked like a horse, but I, don't, I can't tell whether it's a horse. It looked like a horse, but it's not like a horse. You know, the way, the way people in, <laughs> give revelation these days. It looks like I'm seeing you somewhere, and like you are there, you are not there. And it looks like you are happy, but you are not happy. And it looks like you are standing, but you are not standing. Lord have mercy. <laughs> As if you are married, but you are not married. <laughs> So, so Daniel says, well, I saw king, when you dreamt, this is what you saw. You saw a, a big image. And the head of the image was gold. The chest was silver. The middle part was bronze. The feet was iron and clay. The king looks at it and says, by what technology do you get this information? What kind of lab are you operating from? What kind of research company do you work for? Because this is unbelievable. The Babylonian system doesn't create this kind of people. Doesn't produce this quality. So he starts to interpret. And he says, you, O king, Daniel chapter 2 from verse 31 to uh, downwards. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Its head was of fine gold, chest and arms, silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we'll tell you the interpretation of it before the king. I just love these guys. Don't you love them? You can almost see the swag by, that they are showing. They just finish all of that, and I'm sure they just step back and say, now, get ready for the interpretation. <laughs> because by the time they finish telling the story, I'm sure the first time they say, there's an image, the king just peps up in his, in his seat, and then they start describing it. The king is dazed. The kingdom of God 
is invading the corridors of power and bringing down the system of Babylon through Daniel. May God raise up Daniels in our time. And he says, so I'm going to tell you the interpretation. <clears throat> you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. It's a very interesting interpretation because Nebuchadnezzar is, is pagan. He's, he's, he's not Christian. He's not Jewish. He has no covenant with God, but God gave him power. That just gives you an idea that there are people who may not be Christian, but God can give them power. All these Facebook people and uh, Apple people and all the things they do, it's not just because they are smart and creative, but sometimes God picks people who don't know him and still uses them. All right. It says, so you king, uh, God, the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, all the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you a ruler over them. You are this head of gold. But after you, now that's something dangerous to tell a sovereign monarch, that, an absolute monarch, that there's something after you. Because he can kill you just for imagining that he would not last forever. But Daniel is very bold. He says, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of man, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So, Daniel sees the great image. There are two important things I want you to consider as what Daniel saw. The big image and the big stone. The big image and the big stone. The big image seemed very formidable, unbreakable, unshakable, but a stone came and dislodged it. The big image had the head of gold. It represented, by Daniel's interpretation, the kingdom of Babylon. And that is the only kingdom that Daniel mentioned by name. So it makes the next kingdoms a bit subjective, but relatively we can figure out which kingdoms they were. Uh, so this is Babylonian kingdom. And uh, for 66 years, the Babylonian kingdom ruled 66 years. It is a kingdom that Daniel was in at that time. And Daniel said that uh, after the Babylonian system, Nebuchadnezzar was going to go and, and a new kingdom would come and that that would be a, a silver chest with arms, two arms. It's very important. Most historians believe it is the Medo Persian kingdom. The Medo Persian kingdom, the kingdom of the Medes and the kingdom of the Persians. One arm Persia, one arm Medes. They, 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 these two became one kingdom. And they, and that was a kingdom that Esther lived in. It came after Nebuchadnezzar. That's where Esther was, and that's what Esther had all his confrontation 
uh, were, were the king and, and the deliverance of the Jewish people. This kingdom lasted for 208 years. 208 years. Then Daniel said there will be another kingdom of bronze. Most believe that kingdom to be the Greek Greece or the Greek culture uh, with Alexander the Great. And that existed for 185 years. And then after that was the legs of iron and feet of clay, which most people believe was the Roman Empire, which lasted for 500 years. It was in the time of the Roman Empire that Christianity grew. Now remember, Daniel has no clue what is going to happen. But, it, but he says, in that time, a stone was taken from a mountain by an invisible hand. So Daniel is prophesying that there's going to come a time another kingdom shall be raised, not by man, but by the hand of God. And he said that kingdom was going to come out of nowhere. It was hewn out of nowhere, and it was taken uh, by the hand of God. And he says that as the stone was cut out, it was held against the structure of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, that's it. That's the image there. And he says that brought the image down. Now, this is very important. Now, what Daniel is saying is that the Babylonian system or the system that started with Nebuchadnezzar and ran through to the Roman system, which went through to what we call the European system, which is currently the system your country is operating, cannot survive the power of the church. It cannot. The only way it will survive is if the stone stays in its world and never moves to confront the image. But if the stone engages the image, the stone will win. That is why the whole concept of the separation of church and state exists. Let the church stay in its mountain and let Babylon stay in its world because any time the church confronts the systems of this world, the church is going to win. So the church has grown with the idea, well, we are Christians, we are in this world, we are not of this world. This world is not our home, we are just passing through. Heaven is our home, the earth is useless, it will roll away. The biggest lie the devil can tell the believer is just stay in your world and hope to go to heaven and leave the world as it is because this system is not our system. But the Bible teaches us from this revelation of Daniel that this system must not be allowed to stay alone. The church must not just stay on its mountain. The church must move from its mountain and encounter the systems of this world. And in that encounter, the church may seem weak, it may seem uh, not formidable, but the church will win. There are a few things you would notice about the stone that came out first, that it was supernatural. It's a supernatural stone, the Bible says, it is cut without hands. It is cut without hands. Secondly, it is militant. It strikes the image. It doesn't just stand by itself. It is militant. It doesn't just stay in its corner. It is militant. It doesn't just pray for those in authority. It seeks to be in authority. I told people years ago, I said, I don't go for public functions and do opening prayer and closing prayer. I'm through with that. Because, you know, politicians want to have their event. They tell, oh, Reverend Minister, you're the Reverend. Come and give us the opening prayer. 
and don't do anything when we're ready to go, you say the benediction. In between, whatever happens doesn't concern you. Just open and close. Where the meat is, we are not involved. They want us just to provide spiritual guidance, spiritual support, help and comfort the weak and the needy. That's what they want us to do. When the world is confused, we go to our places of worship where we seek comfort. Yes, there is a truth that people come to seek comfort. But Jesus did not raise the church to be a place of comfort. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is an active statement. He didn't say the, the church or the gates, uh, well, let me put it this way. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The impression you get is that hell is a gate. And something is going to come against the gate. The one which is supposed to be moving is not the gate. It is a thing coming into the gate. The church is not supposed to stand aside to be invaded. The church must be the one which goes against the gates of hell. And the Bible says when we go against the gates of hell, it will not prevail. If we dare to go. If we dare to go, if we go to the entertainment world, it will not prevail. If we enter the media world, it will not prevail. If we enter research and development, it will not prevail. We get into academia, it will not prevail. The only way it will prevail is if we are taught that we should look up to heaven and leave the earth. I love the fact that the hope of the Christian is going to heaven. And we should always keep that as our ultimate. But we are on a journey. If you are traveling from one place to the other, from the place, the time you take off and your arrival, there will be a lot of activities. You cannot just be so focused on your destination that you miss your plane. And you don't get involved in anything else and say, well, I'm waiting for the time when I arrive. Well, you have to do some walking. You have to do some battle. You have to overcome some, some challenges. You have to possess some inheritance and some territory. So the church must by all means know where it is going to end up in heaven. But in between now and then, we must deal with the image of Babylon. And we must bring it down. Daniel was there as a weak person, a slave, caught in a battle, conquered, but he allowed God to be magnified in him. The church is supernatural, or the stone was supernatural. It is militant. It is triumphant. It becomes a great mountain, and it is universal. It fills the whole earth. After Daniel had interpreted this dream, you would think that Nebuchadnezzar would be upset because he was just made to know that he was a temporary leader. He was not a permanent leader. That something more durable will come after him. That yes, there will be kingdoms coming after him, but finally something bigger, better, greater will come after him. In other words, God, uh, Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar, you are not the big deal. You are great, but you're not the big deal. The bigger one is coming after you. And when it comes, it will knock off this system you started, which was perpetrated by the Greeks and the Middle Persians and the Romans and went through the what we call Western civilization. It will be uprooted by the stone. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 46 to 49, this is what happens. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel. Can you imagine that? 
This is king of kings. Kings prostrate before him. He is a ruler. Nobody bow. He doesn't bow before anybody. Everybody bows to him. But for the first time, he met a young man from Judah, and he bows before Daniel. At this time, we can say the kingdom of God smuggled into Babylon has overcome the Babylonian system. It didn't overcome it permanently, but in this encounter, this young Hebrew ex-slave has now become the winner. The king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. That's serious. Basically, what he says is, that's your God. They, they, they didn't believe in an unseen God. They said, well, if this guy can do that, then offer incense to him. Worship him. Because the king himself is worshiping him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler, ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king and he said, Shadrach, he said Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. This is just a recent graduate from the university. He just finished, graduated last year. First assignment, he's promoted above everybody. And he kept that position for 70 years. He kept it for 70 solid years. At this time, Daniel is about 16, well, well, he got there about 15, so at this time he's about 18, 19 years. He's a teenager, barely out of his teens into his early 20s. He's the big boss. The king bows to him. And I like Daniel. He says, by the way, king, I gave the interpretation, but, you know, there are more of us here. And, and Shadrach is, is good. And Meshach is good too. And Abednego is good too. So it's not just about me. We are a company of people. We have the same technology. We worship the same God. So fix them too. So Daniel is up there. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in top place. And they're just about 19 years old. And they've conquered every wise man, every astrologer, every professor, every educated person, every counselor. They, they've just fixed everybody just after college. Now, but you know that's not the end of the story. Take time to read the book of Daniel because that is when the conspiracy starts. Because... If you're going to stay in the corridors of power, people are going to conspire against you. So, uh, you know, you would think Nebuchadnezzar is a nice guy. I like, I like him. But, you know, these guys are very bad people and very stubborn. No matter how much God shows them, they don't repent fully. So in chapter 3, after this powerful revelation, Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, I'm going to build. If I'm the head of gold, now I'm make, making the whole thing of gold. In other words, I don't want anything to come after me, and I'm going to be here permanently. So it, let's create a new image of me, and I have a feeling he created the image that he saw in his dream. But he didn't just make the head of gold. He made the whole thing of gold. Nebuchadnezzar is saying, no one is coming after me. I'm gold. I'll be gold through. Because he's still power conscious. He's, confronted, he's been confronted by the power of God, but his motivation for control is very strong. So he builds this huge golden image. And he says 
I don't know whether he thought about it or didn't think through it or somebody advised him, but he just makes a decree. When this thing is set up, anytime you hear the trumpet sound, everybody should bow to the golden image. So at one meeting where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now remember they are big shots, they are now in at the top level. So this is this is a big meeting, and so they are prominently uh, seated. The trumpet sounds, everybody bows to the image, and the three boys are sticking out. Now, if you don't get promoted, nobody sees when you don't bow, but when you get promoted, they'll see that you didn't bow. You are very visible. So they don't bow. And the king is distraught because these are his great advisors. He believes in them, but he just realizes the decree will affect them. They throw them in the fire, and you know the end of the story. And right after that, Nebuchadnezzar comes and makes another confession. And then backslides again. <laughs> you know, and he goes through confessing and backsliding. His son, Belshazzar, comes in the same way. And it just happens about that. But every period for the 70 years of Daniel's life, he gets thrown in the lion's den because people are scheming all around him. But he survives 70 years of palace intrigue. Why am I telling you all this? Once you step into the corridors of power, you will be observed. You will be visible. And when you don't bow, it will be known. And everybody is going to use every trick they know to try and get you. Do you still want to be in the corridors of power? Because once you get there, you're going to fight. Every day is going to be a day of fight for survival. Every day. It's like everybody, anybody who is a politician will tell you. When you become a minister or state or you, you get your promotion and, and get an office, that's a nice day, but that's the beginning of your troubles. Because people are going to gun for your position. You're going to fight. Now, you cannot say, well, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight again. Take your post. No. Daniel didn't say, take your post. He held it for 70 years. Never giving up. Never surrendering. He held on to that power for 70 years until the first return of the Jews back to Judah. He had to preside under the Babylonian kingdom under the Middle Persian kingdom, right up to Darius. And then he died. But the battle continued to be fought because Esther also had to rise up in that place and get to the corridors of power to continue fighting for the kingdom of our God. If we are going to make a difference in this world, we have to realize that the world system never gives up. The world system never gives up. You're going to win major battles, but they don't get discouraged. The devil never gets discouraged. He's been bound. He's been cast out. He's been rejected. I mean, look at all the prayer we pray. We bind him. We cast him out. We bomb him. We bazooka him. We, these days, people are machine gunning him in the blood of Jesus. I mean, this guy is suffering all of that but he's still moving on. He's a very relentless devil. Now, if he doesn't give up, do you think we should give up? At Calvary, he was defeated. Jesus defeated him, made a public show of him, triumphed over him in it. You would think, well, finally, the devil will be so embarrassed because he was defeated in front of his own demons. He has no name, but the devil has no shame. Right after that, he was going to come up and continue his job. And he will keep doing it until the final day. He's not going to give up. And the world system will never give up. The thing with the church is when we win big battles like what Daniel won, we assume that 
It's going to be easy from now onwards. It's never going to be easy. It's never going to be easy. We're going to continue fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. The church in America won a lot of great victories. But then they forgot they were in a battle. And everything just became about themselves and living a good life and living a happy life and just being happy and enjoying life. You know, just enjoy life. Just be happy. Just be happy. And whilst we're being happy, we lost ground. But it's not lost permanently. Everything the church has lost is not lost permanently. There can be a Daniel, and may God raise Daniels. And I believe that Daniel will be a Nigerian. <laughs> God will raise Daniels to come back, to enter forbidden places, the corridors of power, and cause Nebuchadnezzar to bow again. And we have to keep doing that to establish the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. I think I have to end somewhere here. I don't have too much time to go through everything. But my desire and my prayer uh, is to see Christians enter into every field of endeavor and enter to the top. I want to see Christian young men and women becoming actors and actresses, producers, script writers, animators, start entering into all the major production houses. Take Christ to the production houses. Take Christ to the studio floors. Because the greatest force in your country, in my country, in this world, is not even the military. It is the media. And entertainment. And the movies they show, and the series they show, and the reality television. The things we have, we have permitted in the last 10 years were on ahead of 30 years ago. Nobody ever thought those things would happen. They happen so easily. And until Daniel gets to that place, the depravity will continue and get worse. There are those who say, well, Jesus is coming, the world will get worse and worse and worse and worse. I can't answer all of that. All I can say is, as far as it lies with us, and from what I know from the scripture, we can stop the systems of Babylon because the Bible tells us that that is possible. We can't just give up and say, well, this is how it's going to be. In the last days, in the last days, in the last days, two things will, will happen. There will be wickedness, and there will be the glory of God. Now, I choose the glory of God. So, whenever you read Bible prophecy, it will tell you two possible outcomes of the last days. That either things are going to get worse, or the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I choose to be on the glory side. I choose to be on the glory side. That we can bring the glory of God down. And we can make his power felt. Wherever you are, and some of you, maybe it may not be you, it may be your children. Let us teach our children to be bold. And when they want to enter dangerous spaces, let us not be so afraid. All you need to do is do what was done for Daniel. Ground him or her in her faith. Let her know Christ in depth and in spirit. Arm her with the full armor of Christ and send them as ambassadors for Christ to go and fight for Jesus Christ. We cannot just stay in the safe industries and safe businesses. We have to go to the top in the risky areas and fight for Jesus. That's what Daniel did. That's what Esther did. 
That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. And thank God for their testimony of people who walked in the corridors of power. And may God touch you and raise you into the corridors of power. In the finest industry, in the military, in politics, rise to the corridors of power. Go run for election, run for the council, run for city elections, run for state elections, go to the Senate, go to Congress, go out there, let your voice be heard. Go to the media, get into the news media and let your voice be heard. Start a blog, start writing stories, start influencing ideas. Use your Facebook, not just to exchange pictures, but to exchange ideas. Start consciously, deliberately, intentionally influencing society because we have been called to move in the corridors of power. May the Lord raise in Jesus' house Daniels and Esthers. May God raise in this place men and women who would go where our parents were afraid to go and take the kingdom of God right in the camp of the enemy. We want to see Nebuchadnezzar fall prostrate and bow before us. God bless you.